we uh, step through things here. But um, I'd like to welcome everyone today um, to uh, today's technical webinar for Freedom. My name is Ken Delaney, and I'm the Director of Industry and Innovation at Freedom. For those of you who don't know, we are a Power Systems and Power Electronics Research Center headquartered at NC State University. Um, our research projects span renewable energy integration, electric vehicle technologies, control techniques, microgrids, applications of wide band gap semiconductors, and traditional power systems analysis. We have extensive lab capabilities, including multiple simulation labs for hardware and loop development, an electronics packaging lab, and a high bay look space for evaluating medium voltage applications up to 15 kV AC input. Together with our industry partners like ABB, Duke Energy, and New York Power Authority, we are leading the electrification revolution. So hopefully everyone is familiar with Zoom. Um, we have disabled audio and video for every, all participants as they join. And we ask that you use the chat feature to ask questions. Um, just hover your mouse over the Zoom window and the button should appear at the bottom of that window. Click chat, type your question, and we'll answer as many as we can during the presentation. Um, note that this webinar is being recorded. Hopefully, Ms. Kalal uh, figured out how to hit record, um, or remember to hit record. Uh, and we'll, eventually, we'll be posting this to the YouTube channel for the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at NC State. Um, today's presenters are uh, Dr. Reza Tavakali and Dr. Jake Opantic, and we'll be learning a lot about wireless power transfer. So I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Tavakali. Um, hello, everybody and welcome to our technical webinar today. Uh, here is the outline of our presentation today, and I will first start with a brief introduction myself, about myself, and then I will continue about the WPT presentation. Um, as Ken mentioned, my name is Reza Tavakoli. After receiving my bachelor and master degrees in electrical engineering in 2011 and 2014, I joined Utah State University as a PhD student. From 2015 to 2020, I worked at Select Research Center as a graduate researcher. Uh, mainly there I worked on wireless charging system. The photo that you see on this slide has been taken in 2016 Select Showcase, where we showed a 25 kilowatt WPT system that was charging an electric bus in motion. Uh, you see the electric bus behind us in this photo. I continued my research there, focusing on wireless charging for other applications like electric wheelchairs and then passenger vehicles, and I designed several uh, misalignment estimation systems. Uh, since February 2020, I joined NC State University as a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, currently, I work at Freedom System Center with Dr. Jacob Pantich, where we are continuing our research on high frequency WPT systems. So that's enough about me. Let's dive into the WPT. Uh, wireless power transfer is not new. Nikola Tesla published a paper on 1898 discussing the idea. And on the right hand side, you see a photo of a paper published in 1921 when the author show uh, wireless power transfer with a two coils having one foot separation. Our WPT is based on fundamental electromagnetic equations, Ampere's law and Faraday's law. It has found many applications in electric vehicles, automated guided vehicles and personal transportation like electric scooters. The main focus of this presentation today is regarding these applications. However, there are other applications like, you know, wireless power transfer for bio implement, implants, charging robots, uh, charging cell phones, or energy harvesting for radio frequency circuits. Uh, WPT is basically using two uh, methods. One is uh, inductive and the other is capacitive. In inductive charging, we work with our magnetic field, while in capacitive charging, basically we work with electric field. However, we can have a hybrid, which is combination of inductive and capacitive. The other category is our stationary charger versus dynamic charger. In the stationary charger, we are uh, doing 
we are charging the electric vehicle while the vehicle is parked and we charge the battery. In dynamic charging while the vehicle is moving, we transfer power to the moving vehicle. In this slide, I'm showing the basic structure of inductive wireless power transfer. We have our three phase grid system after rectification and an optional buck converter to change the DC value of the voltage. We have a high frequency inverter that allows us to invert the DC voltage to a frequency from anywhere 20 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz. Then we have our compensation tank, which uh, the main, the main role of this compensation network is to compensate for the reactive power that the transmitter coil requires. It also helps us with the filtering the harmonics in the voltage or current. It can also help us to get a current source out of a voltage source. Then we have our transmitter coil. This transmitter coil is made of Litz wire. Litz wire helps us to reduce the proximity effect and the skin effect. We can also use ferrites to reduce the, to increase the mutual inductance. We can also use aluminum to uh, uh, help with the reducing the leakage field outside the uh, transmitter pad. Uh, these uh, components that I mentioned up to now, they are located at the road side and at the transmitter side. Then we'll have a air gap, and then we reach the secondary side that is located on the vehicle. We have a receiver pad, a very similar in the uh, uh, in terms of having list wire, ferrite, and aluminum, but and their dim its dimension might be a slightly smaller or bigger than the transmitter. Then we're going to have a compensation tank with similar role that we had at the transmitter side, and we have a power conditioner unit where it helps us to control the rate of the rate of charging of the battery and then we reach to the uh, EV data. And this next section, I will talk about some frequently asked questions on WPT. The first question is, does wireless charging takes longer? Assuming that we have a 50 kilowatt wireless charger and a 50 kilowatt uh, conductive charger, since the power transfer is the same, you're going to charge your vehicle with the same rate during the same time. So WPT is no different than, uh, wireless power is no different than conductive charge. Is it WPT good for the battery? The battery would not know if it's conductive charging or inductive charge. So in that sense, wireless charging is the same as conductive charge. However, if we assume that wireless charging or dynamic wireless charging allows us more frequently to charge our vehicle, then in that sense, it can be even good for the battery. Because in terms of more frequent charging of the battery, we don't allow the battery to be fully depleted. So in that sense, we can increase the battery lifetime. The other frequently asked question is, is WPT efficient? A misconception is that because we have an air gap in WPT, so it should be lost. But it should be uh, noted that the losses do not occur in the air gap. The losses in the WPT system occur on the same component that exists both in inductive charging versus conductive charging. So we are seeing now systems reporting with efficiency of 95%, efficiency of 97% in WPT. And these efficiencies are very similar to what you can get from a DC fast charger. So in terms of efficiency, we can get very similar performance. The other question is if WPT is safe. We need to pay attention to the fact that we are not going to energize a transmitter pad unless there is a vehicle on top and the vehicle has been acknowledged and authorized to be charged and we are sure that that EV is compatible for receiving the power. A good analogy for that is like your kitchen microwave oven. Your microwave oven won't start until you close the lid. Here we won't energize the pad unless, unless there is a vehicle on top. The other point is, um, 
the operating vo uh, operating frequency is uh, standard says about 85 kilohertz, which is below the tissue heating uh, based on the IEEE standard. However, we need to know that at 85 kilohertz, we would have some impact on the nervous system. So designers should pay attention to controlling the leakage field out of the, uh, around the VA. The other question is about the impact on the grid. Well, let's uh, think about a um, port facility. In the port facility we have, in a port we have a lot of electric cargo handling trucks and forklifts. These are electric vehicles that uh, need to be charged. And um, currently they are charged uh, during the lunch break or at in the, during the evening when we have the peak load of the grid. But if we have EWPT and semi-stationary WPT in the port, we have the option to charge our uh, vehicles more frequently. And that allows us to level the peak for the grid. And in that sense, it can help the grid. The other factor is about compatibility. If uh, we have seen, uh, we, have, we, doesn't, we didn't see that any OEMs complaining about adding a new uh, receiver pad under the car. So we, have, uh, we are seeing that uh, having a receiver pad being installed under the vehicles. We need to pay attention that either it is conductive charging for the vehicle or inductive charging for the vehicle. We always need two parts. One part goes on the ground, the another part goes on the vehicle. So, and in terms of the price, uh, the price, uh, the component that goes on the vehicle uh, for DC fast charging would be very similar to the component you need for wireless charging. So in terms of the physical compatibility, WPT uh, doesn't have any issue. But the other compatibility is about electromagnetic interference. Um, <clears throat> there has not been any interference in terms of uh, interference of WPT with the ADOS system, advanced driver assistance system, in terms of uh, automated vehicle, so we are sure that uh, WPT would, would not interfere with that. Uh, and we haven't seen any interference with the power electronics in the electric vehicle. Um, the, uh, we haven't seen any conductor or radiated emission due to WPT. One important factor is that now do we have economic incentive to go toward WPT for electric vehicles? There is highly the most probably future of driving would be autonomous driving. And autonomous driving would need autonomous fueling. So right now you see currently we have vehicles with automated parking. If you have automated parking, then we can simply add automated charging and it would have a very huge market for that. But but we think the immediate market for WPT for electric vehicles first would be fleet, port facilities, trucks and buses, last mile delivery vehicles, and then passenger vehicles. A good example of electrification is Northern Europe where electrification is happening right now. But you might ask that why we don't see commercialized dynamic wireless power transfer. Right now we have commercialized stationary WPT system, but in terms of dynamic wireless power transfer, we haven't seen the commercialized one. One of the reason is the higher cost because for DWPT, we need to put the transmitter pads into a long portion of the road. It would cost, it would require a lot of money. The second uh, problem is about efficiency. Uh, people have used longer calls for dynamic wireless power transfer to transfer more energy. In that sense, the efficiency would be lower compared to compact coils used in static charge. The other problem is about uh, autonomy and misalignment. Uh, until we have full autonomous driving system, we uh, always have misalignment between transmitter and receiver paths. And because we have misalignment between transmitter and receiver pad, the power transfer capability would drop, the efficiency would drop. And the last but not least would be the need for standardization. 
because there are several, several types of vehicles that they need to be charged from the same road. So they need to be interoperable. So, so we need a standardization here. Hey Reza, we do have a question um, from one of the attendees real quick, and it's related to dynamic uh, wireless power charging. Um, how do you select the LITS wire parameters, for example, for a one kilowatt system? And that may be a really long answer. I don't know if there's a short answer for that. Uh, please, um, just uh, a short answer would be how much current you want to have in your coil and probably uh, based on the rated current that you have, you can select the AWG list for the unit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So with having these four uh, problem with the uh, dynamic wireless power transfer, I will explain about two projects that in those projects, we try to address these first three problems, the cost, the efficiency, and the misalignment. These projects were sponsored by Toyota Motor North America. So here uh, on the top side, we are showing the block diagram of a DWPT system. The research on DWPT system is mainly focused on the coil or pad design, uh, on compensation topologies, and the uh, power converters and control methods. Starting with the transmitter pad configuration, the initial uh, topologies for DWPT, people, researchers were using elongated rails. These rails, anywhere from 10 meter to 25 meter, they were uh, providing a stable power transfer. However, because we were energizing a very long portion of the road, the efficiency was low. We had a simple controller, but we had the some safety issues as well here. The other uh, option is to use lumped pad. These pads are very similar to the pads that we have for a stationary charging. In terms of stationary charging, we have high efficiency, but because we have a lot more number of pads and each pad needs its own inverter, the cost would increase, the controller would be complicated, and the power that the vehicle would receive would be pulsating. In this project, we went with the com compromise between these two options with elongated pad, anywhere from one to three meter a compromise between the, these uh, two options that I just mentioned. So we started with optimization of the elongated pad and we selected rectangular pads and tried to optimize mm, a dozen of important variables here from the length, width of the link length, and the width of the coil, and all the parameters that are affecting the operation of the pad. We developed a uh, optimization algorithm, mainly based on particle storm optimization. And we looked at two main uh, functions. One was the cost of the system and the efficiency. And here the cost is the entire cost of the ground assembly, including the pad, lead wire, ferrite, and aluminum as well as the inverter cost and the compensation cost. And we normalize the cost per meter. So we have a better understanding about what happening when we increase the length of the coil, not just the cost per pad. And we looked at the efficiency of the pad. Uh, the color bar on this scatter plot on the left hand side shows the length of uh, the different design and each uh, dot in this scatter plot is showing one unique design. And we can see that shorter pads with the pad length about one meter here, you can see blue ones are about one meter are having higher efficiency, which was expected. But at the same time, it has higher cost. If we select longer pads, which, is, which are about three meter, we have lower cost, but lower efficiency. We can uh, obviously see a Pareto front here and designer needs to decide based on the uh, best, uh, based on the uh, desired cost and desired efficiency, select the design from this part to front. The other thing that we need to uh, select here is what is the power drop we are allowing between two consecutive paths. As the paths are closer and closer to each other, the power drop between two paths, the power drop that the receiver would see would be reduced. 
what we decided in this project was that we want a seamless transition. So when the vehicle goes from one path to the next path, we don't see any drop between the paths, between the paths. Then we wanted to have a fully sensorless operation. So the scheme that we picked was uh, when the vehicle is well before a transmitter pad, we don't have any mutual inductance. In this case, we energize the transmitter current, transmitter coil with a low current. And because we have no mutual inductance, we cannot transfer any power. As the vehicle approaches this transmitter pad, we can see an increase in the mutual inductance. As the mutual inductance increases, we can transfer some power to the receiver. And that increase in the power transfer would be reflected on the DC link, DC link current, which is on the roadside. So the controller just samples this DC link current, and whenever it sees a change and reaches a threshold, it will increase the track coil energization current to the full current. And while the vehicle is on top, we can transfer full power. As the vehicle goes away from the transmitter pad, the mutual inductance would drop. And as the mutual inductance drop, power transfer capability would drop. And due to that, the DC link current would drop. When it goes below a threshold, we fully turn off the pad and we have a sensorless activation and deactivation of the pad without, by just looking at the DC link current, which is located at the transmitter side. As I mentioned before, we needed, we wanted to have a seamless transition between the paths. So uh, here we are studying two paths, but it can be extended to any number of paths. When the vehicle uh, reaches the first pad, we see similar uh, uh, performance as I explained in the previous slide. We energize the first pad as the vehicle reaches on top of the first pad. But here, the first pad, because he's transferring power, it will inform the red pad, this next pad, that a vehicle is coming. So the vehicle, the second pad is ready. And the moment that the DC link current for the first pad starts to drop, we are going, the controller energizes the second pad. So when the vehicle is in between two transmitter pad, both pads are energized and the uh, transmitter coil current are controlled such that the summation of the power transfer would be constant. So vehicle does not see any drop in the power. As we reach to the, over the second pad, we have enough mutual inductance, we fully turn off the first pad. Based on these two uh, sensorless activation and the seamless transition, we designed a comprehensive controller, which detects three critical time instants. These time instants are, instant one, two, three that I'm showing here. Each pad has its own microcontroller, has its own inverter. And by just measuring the DC link current and con controlling its inverter, it can do this uh, sensorless activation and deactivation and the seamless transition that you see here. To show the, um, we implemented this algorithm on a experimental setup. We designed our three pad, designed our transmitter pad for a 30 kilowatt system. Three transmitter pads were uh, manufactured and embedded in the road that you see on this left hand side. We used a Toyota RAV4 vehicle and installed the receiver pad uh, under the vehicle. Um, we implemented our uh, inverter, compensation tank, and controller boxes in an electric panel by the road. Uh, this test that we conducted was a 3.7 kilowatt. Later on, my colleagues at Utah State University uh, went ahead and uh, improved the power up to 30 kilowatt. On the left hand side, you see the DC link current, inverter voltage, and inverter current at steady state. And on the right hand side, you see the operation with three pads. And these pads are energized and de energized such that we have a seamless transition in between. And each pad is only, uh, each pad is only energized when the vehicle is on top. 
we tested the vehicle at different speed. And as you see on this left hand side, we have the track current of the first coil, first with the low current. When the vehicle reaches here, we go to the full power. And as uh, the uh, vehicle is passing by, but controlling the track current, we transfer a constant power. And then as the DC link current is going down, we energize the second path. We increased the vehicle speed up to 40 miles per hour. That was the maximum speed that we could achieve in our test track. Uh, we have more oscillation, but it should be noted that each pad is only energized about 100 millisecond. And in this 100 millisecond, we are able to fully energize and turn off each pad at the exact time. And you see the moment that DC link current here at the first pad is starting to drop, the second pad starts to increase and for the third pad, and it can be extended to any number of uh, transmitter pads. Uh, here is a video of the test that we were doing um, in our test track. You see on this monitor that first the first track current is energized with the lower current, and then the three paths in this test track are energized one after each other. The photo that you see on the previous slide, uh, it is the relevant test with that. Uh, one, uh, so raise it before the slide. We did have a question. Um, how far or how deep are the coils embedded in the roadway? They are about two inches here. And I think that is like the, uh, you need, you want to have the minimum depth, but like, you know, you cannot have less than two inches. Okay. And then is there anything special you have to do to protect the coils from the backfill? No, we didn't do anything about that. Okay. Uh, other thing is about how fast do we, are we energizing the pad? And we are going to that initial energization in 600 microseconds. 600 microseconds means that at 80 miles per hour, we only, uh, the vehicle only moves about two centimeter. It means that if the receiver pad is just two centimeter before the first pad, we have enough time to go all these, go through all these wireless power transfers. With this uh, test, I will go to the next project we did was considering misalignment estimation system. I explained before that as we have uh, more misalignment in our system, the power transfer would drop and as, and as well as efficiency would drop. So we designed a system that helps us to estimate the lateral and vertical misalignment of the vehicle. On the right hand side, you see the 3D view of the system structure. And what we are seeing here is we are using the same transmitter coils that were in charge of transferring power. We use the same transmitter path to misestimate misalignment. So we see the transmitter path and the receiver pad here. They are in charge of transferring power. We installed three tiny sensing coils in front of the receiver pad. And then on the left hand side, we see the uh, EV bottom view and where we are installing our sensing coils uh, under the front bumper of the vehicle. And uh, these uh, sensing coils are measuring the magnetic field and giving that to a artificial intelligence unit. In our case, we use artificial neural networks and the neural networks ANN is estimating the lateral and vertical misalignment. That can be um, you know, easily reported to the, via, to the driver and it, as well as it, in terms of automated system, uh, autonomous driving, it can be used for uh, compensating for the misalignment and correcting the misalignment. The idea behind this uh, structure is based on the magnetic field on top of the transmitter pads. On the left hand side, we see the Y component, lateral component of the magnetic field on top of the transmitter pad. And here is the width of the pad and this is the length of the pad. At any position on top of the transmitter pad, we have this 2D view I'm showing on the right hand side. When a sensor is moving along the pad, it will measure a specific magnetic field. By just sampling those magnetic fields, 
the neural network is able to predict the lateral and vertical misalignment. To test this ideal, we put three magnetic sensors that I'm showing in this uh, test setup uh, on an aluminum plate being pushed by an RC car. For easier test, we put our receiver side under and our transmitter pad over that, and we flip the transmitter pad. It just for easier test, but it does not change the concept. Then we did, um, I, uh, we implemented this idea, and this figure that you see on the left hand side, on this highlighted window, it is where we are seeing the sensor measurements when they go under this transmitter pad. And each sensor is measuring its own magnetic field because they are located at different positions. And based on these values that it's reading, the neural network is able to predict the lateral misalignment and vertical misalignment in real time. I'm showing here the lateral misalignment with this red um, curve here. And here it is showing the lateral misalignment in real time and the x-axis is time. Uh, our actual lateral misalignment was 15 centimeter and here we are estimating 14.83 centimeter after average. Uh, and this next is I'm showing the vertical misalignment again for a different test lateral misalignment was zero centimeter vertical misalignment was 19.5 centimeter. And here uh, we see that you see that we are measuring 19.69 and the sensors are measuring something else because the lateral misalignment is different vertical misalignment is different. How do we integrate this system with WPT? Uh, here on the left hand side, I'm showing that how when the receiver pad, because receiver pad and the sensing coils are located at two different positions of the vehicle. One is at the front, under the front bumper, one at the center of the vehicle. When the receiver pad uh, is under this green pad, over in this green pad and it's receiving power, the sensing coils are on top of the next pad, the red pad. And so with that condition, once one pad is transferring power, the other pad is transferring, uh, is used for misalignment estimation. With this, uh, we are using a different frequency for misalignment estimation so that we didn't want to uh, uh, have any interference between two consecutive pads. Um, we, uh, I'm showing on the right hand side how the idea would work. Uh, the transmitter uh, coil, this red coil, go through two frequencies, 4.3 kilohertz when the first pad is transferring power. It is energized with 4.3 kilohertz. It's a uh, sample frequency. It can be other frequencies. Um, and when the vehicle reaches to the uh, position of the second pad, it will go to 85 kilohertz to transfer power. Here on the left hand side, I'm showing that how this idea is implemented with while two pads are implementing this idea. Uh, we are having full power transfer. There are two pads and you have seamless transition between two pads, but this is the track current of the uh, second pad going through four kilohertz, 85 kilohertz and the inverter voltage, the same inverter that is used for power transfer, that same inverter uh, used for misalignment estimation we can go from four kilohertz to 85 kilohertz in less than five milliseconds. This time is more than enough for us to, uh, for the actual system with the pads in the length of uh, one to three meters. Uh, with this uh, uh, discussion about this project that we finished at Utah State University, uh, Dr. Pandish will discuss about our current work at NC State University and Freedom Research Center. Dr. Pantich, please. So actually, raise it before, uh, Dr. Pantich, before you get started, um, there was a question in the chat that's related to um, efficiency. So with this misalignment estimation, you're relying on sensors. Earlier when you were describing the sensorless um, mm -hmm. uh, the process, is there some, have you looked at efficiency differences between these two uh, methods? So uh, one was for misalignment estimation, and those sensors are not related to power transfer. They are just for misalignment estimation. Power transfer can be done with and without these uh, sensing coils, but when you have 
So, for example, completely aligned system, you can easily get an efficiency about 90, 90%. But as the efficiency, as you have like, let's say six to 10 centimeter misalignment, your efficiency from 90% goes down to 85%. But as the misalignment goes over, for example, 10 centimeter, you cannot transfer full power of 30 kilowatt anymore. Okay. And the, that initial current where the, the coils overlap, mm -hmm. um, you've got an initial current, like say, for example, in the first coil until the mutual inductance align. Is there right. some efficiency loss there? Yes, true. If you look at what I'm showing here, so if you see, I, excuse me, I'm showing a some DC link current here without having the current. So these DC link current are associated with the losses in that period, but uh, they are very much lower than the current that losses we have during the full power operation because this is like a much lower current than the nominal. If the nominal current is 50 amps or 75 amps in our design, that would be just 10 amps. And the power would be, I don't know, one fifth or 20% of the losses you would have for the full power. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, Dr. Pantich, we'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tavakoli, uh, for presenting. Uh, let me introduce briefly myself. My name is Jacob Pantic and I'm Associate Professor in North Carolina State, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I'm working in the area of wireless power transfer for more than 10 years. Uh, I spent five years as a, a, so Assistant Professor at Utah State University and currently I'm Associate Professor in North Carolina State. Some of these projects and some other projects were projects I was leading at uh, Utah State University. And now I'm going to present some uh, future work and uh, work, uh, current work that we are conducting at North Carolina State. First of all, I will start uh, uh, with uh, uh, our interest in uh, um, uh, wireless power transfer for personal mobility and uh, uh, power wheelchair and electric scooter particularly. So uh, to motivate the reason why we're interested in this topic, I would like to share with you uh, some results of a survey conducting among, among the people with disabilities who are wheelchair users and user, uh, users of power, electric wheelchair. So uh, they were asked to select among different, I think more than 10 uh, um, futuristic transportation and mobility inventions. And to my biggest surprise, they actually selected new energy sources. The 34% wanted to have a new energy source. Why it's in that is interesting because, because uh, for, for uh, researchers and, and, and uh, the uh, energy source is something very common, but obviously for people with disability uh, whose uh, uh, mobility and sometimes even life depends of energy stored in their wheelchairs, that's actually a very important question. Uh, so uh, uh, to, 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 to help with that problem, uh, we worked on a project funded by the Department of Health and Human Services where we developed two generations of uh, uh, wireless power transfer chargers for electric wheelchairs. Uh, you see the photo of one of these generations. Let me uh, see if I can uh, take uh, mm, cursor. But uh, Reza is showing now, uh, that's actually a result of our first generations. First generation was, uh, 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 was intended for 250 watts. The second generation was charging electric wheelchairs inside of uh, two hours uh, using two, uh, one kilowatt uh, power. Um, as you can see, we adopted a floor mat concept when uh, wireless power transfer has been integrated inside the floor mat. Uh, power from the wall unit and uh, we allowed uh, a lot of autonomy and, and free positioning of the wheelchair over that floor mat. Uh, that was the part of the research, but I would like, I like to share something else that people with disability who are uh, power wheelchair users, uh, what they face they face a lack of public charging infrastructure. When they leave their home, it's very difficult to find a place that will be compatible for, uh, with their chargers. And uh, just to, sh to share with you uh, some numbers, uh, we have 1.1 million electric vehicles in the US and we have uh, uh, over 22,000 
public charging spots as of uh, September 2018. At the same time, we have uh, 1.7 uh, personal mobility devices in the US, including power wheelchairs and electric scooters, and only 17 public charging spots. And these public charging spots are actually installed by this gentleman you see in the photo, uh, Mr. Umbacher, who is actually uh, in our advisory advisory board for, uh, for the project. So to resolve this problem, problem with the public charging of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, power wheelchairs, we, uh, we applied and we got funded recently from Department of Health and Human Services to uh, develop a public charging infrastructure that also include a cyber informa information network uh, and uh, associated software and uh, 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 mobile applications. And that project will uh, use uh, Chapel Hill as a, a testing site and it's a collaboration between North Carolina State and uh, University of North Carolina. Uh, Reza, could you please move to the next slide? Uh, next, uh, next area of interest uh, for uh, uh, our group here is uh, uh, underwater charging system. Establishing a connection underwater is a very challenging task. And you see some examples uh, of, uh, of some uh, re uh, pro products that are capable of doing so. Uh, uh, Lee technology at this moment uh, is a wet mat connector. Uh, that's actually a, a system that is used underwater to establish contact, but it's also considered uh, by many researchers the weakest part of underwater energy system. And uh, uh, that uh, the liability is limited due to variation of pressure. And uh, uh, the second challenge of uh, wet mat connectors is uh, how to establish connection physically. So today we use uh, divers or we use sophisticated uh, remote operated vehicles to establish that connection. And both of these solutions are relatively expensive and complicated. Uh, when we talk about charging underwater vehicles, uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, these vehicles are very autonomous. Their, uh, their technology is developed I think, every year. However, we still have a problem how to uh, replenish the batteries uh, uh, that they use. And the only uh, very reliable method so far is to practically surface those uh, 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 vehicles, bring them to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to a ship and then replace the battery and, 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 and submerge them again. Uh, there are some attempts, recent attempts to actually provide an underwater charging system for example, some latching techniques. And you see here uh, one of the results uh, you can find in the literature that is related to uh, underwater charging of an AUV where we use, uh, when the researchers use a, a cone and, uh, and a tube and uh, practically AUV enters that, uh, that tube. And then when it's actually in that semi-locked position, we actually transfer power to that. Uh, Department of Energy or, uh, is exploring uh, new methods based on uh, um, a loosely coupled coils and near uh, field resonance. You see the, the photo of that method, uh, the sketch of that method. But of course, if we involve wireless power transfer in this way, there will be a challenge to overcome uh, uh, the, that layer of the water between the coils, uh, especially in, uh, uh, when the salinity is high, that water is very conductive and is going to generate a lot of loss. The second problem we face is, of course, alignment issue, especially in shallow waters when the water currents are strong, it's difficult to maintain the same alignment position between uh, two systems. In our lab, we are working on a system that is uh, sort of uh, middle ground between a, a conductive charger and uh, um, uh, uh, this free, uh, free uh, uh, wireless uh, system proposed by the Department of Defense. And uh, uh, while developing uh, and we, uh, we expect uh, uh, some uh, good results very soon to happen. Um, I would like to move to the next, uh, to the next uh, slide. Thank you. One big challenge for a wireless power transfer system, uh, a dynamic wireless power transfer system, is how to bridge the gap between a WPT bench, when it can, or a laboratory, or even some small outdoor test site to macro scale outdoor testing and implementation. It's difficult to, uh, to show up uh, with a, a laboratory setup to uh, legislators and uh, uh, funding agencies and say, hey, let's invest millions of dollars 
to uh, uh, develop a uh, road that will use uh, dynamic virus uh, gel. So that gaps really exist, and you see a few examples from Oak Ridge, from Oak Ridge for Qualcomm, and some examples from our lab. Those are test sites that are, uh, this enormous effort of the researchers to develop these sites, but still I could say that uh, the uh, reach of this uh, uh, research and experiments is limited. First of all, these laboratory prototypes uh, and, and test sites are relatively expensive. Some uh, our calculations show that they go uh, up to $4,000 per meter or $7,000 per pair, including all electronics and, and uh, uh, water power transfer system. Even if they are long, uh, for example, 50 meters, they will still allow less than five seconds of, uh, of operation, which sometimes is not enough to explore uh, uh, some important characteristics. Uh, thermal characteristic is difficult to explore because they require continuous operation. Uh, we have limited repeatability. If we are talking about outdoor tests, it's very difficult to repeat the experiments and see the effect of some changes. Uh, of course, limited speed range when you talk about indoor tests, uh, even if we talk about outdoor tests, it's difficult to develop speeds of 50, 60 uh, miles, 70 miles per hour. In order uh, to actually resolve this problem, we need to, to, to follow the ideas that are presented with other industries. For example, uh, airplane industry has the same problem. It's very difficult to test an airplane. Uh, well, uh, so you need to, to have uh, simulators, so we need to have emulators, we need to have a complex system that can actually test uh, uh, these uh, systems for hours of operation uh, in the laboratory. And that's why what we are working now is a uh, uh, test station that will be at the final phase connected with a, 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 a simulator, a driving simulator that we have here at NC State, and that will allow hours of testing of uh, dynamic uh, uh, charging uh, systems and also testing different conditions and different misalignments and all, all other uh, conditions. Uh, could you, yes, and the, finally, I would like to, uh, to mention the project that is funded by Power America, uh, where we are exploring uh, uh, high frequency uh, power converters for a wireless power transfer. When we talk about uh, uh, high frequency wireless power transfer, definitely the forerunner forerunner of that uh, uh, is actually uh, class C power converters and its derivative class EF2, class EF5 uh, uh, and, and some other classes. Uh, so, uh, but we, should, uh, we shouldn't forget that these converters are, when they are invented in 1960s, 70s, they were intended for constant load applications because the load is the part of the resonant circuit that is carefully tuned to maintain uh, uh, efficient operation of single switch or multiple switches, in, including in those converters. So, uh, uh, wireless power transfer recognize the potential of class C converters because they are very, very simple and can operate at high frequency, not to mention using a, a gallium nitride wide band gap devices that can actually further extend the, uh, the frequency range and operation. However, wireless power transfer cannot guarantee constant load. When I say constant load, I, I mean uh, um, constant uh, resistance as well as constant variable uh, um, uh, variable uh, uh, reactance of the load. And that happens because of the load variation, but also because of the variation of the gap between primary and secondary. There are different methods uh, and new technologies, new topologies uh, developed so far trying to resolve that issue. And uh, we can actually uh, divide those methods to uh, to passive and active uh, compensation methods. Uh, we, we develop, uh, the researchers develop new techno topologies of these converters, including more elements, but still there is an open field to improve these results, especially considering that these results are sometimes complex, when especially when you talk about active, uh, uh, active tuning systems, uh, they are uh, sensitive uh, uh, to, for uh, to tuning of the elements, sometimes they lack uh, a close forward tuning algorithm, so it's really, really difficult to understand how to tune that algorithm. And sometimes they are, uh, and often they do not include nonlinear uh, uh, phenomena like uh, such as nonlinear parasitic capacitance of the switch itself. So we are working uh, in this project, uh, uh, trying to explore different nonlinear techniques uh, that will be combined with gallium nitride devices 
that will be able to provide a, a passive compensation while still uh, uh, actually uh, allowing much wider range of loads that can be applied to this converter. Uh, that's about the projects. Now I'm going to uh, write. I'm uh, going to use a few minutes to talk about how uh, uh, we see here in in my research group how we see a future development of uh, wireless power transfer. This is just one attempt. I would like to share some thoughts and some classification that we usually use in our group. So. Uh, first of all, I would like to talk about future and current uh, uh, WPT applications. First of all, we can uh, recognize not that large group of uh, uh, applications where the wireless power, power transfer plays a key role. That's actually key technology in the sense that that technology defines the space and, and scope of entire application. And I listed some of them where I believe that wireless power transfer really determines how the other parts of the system will operate determines how large, for example, in the system is. The second, the second uh, technology, I, uh, please, uh, yeah, the second application of wireless power transfer, and that application is growing every day. That's, uh, that uh, application is where the wireless power transfer is there to support autonomy of different devices and vehicles. And that's a very broad category of application that I, including here some of them, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, personal transportation, and dynamic uh, uh, electric vehicle charger charging. So let me use the uh, let me uh, let, let let me use the example of uh, UAVs and explain how application how important wireless power transfer can be in those applications. Uh, so uh, UAVs are very intelligent devices. They have uh, a lot of processing power, excellent cameras. They have uh, 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 communication devices but uh, excellent control algorithm that, that controls flying, but they struggle with the energy. Uh, uh, and after 30 to 40 minutes of flying, we need to land them to replace the battery and they take off again and, and do their mission. So obviously their autonomy is completely limited by uh, limited energy onboard energy sources. So wireless power transfer can really uh, be the last, uh, uh, cutting the last cord and practically allow the system to be autonomous if we actually develop wireless charging, uh, uh, autonomous wireless charging system. Uh, and the final category is where the wireless charging actually supports the operation of the, of the other systems, uh, providing conveniency, improving conveniency of these devices. And I have uh, included here a cell phone charger, consumer electronics, even static electric vehicle charger is just a matter of conveniency. It doesn't really uh, bring uh, uh, some critical issues that will alter the operation of electric vehicle, for example. Uh, based on these three category, I kind of see that uh, different approaches needs to be taken when designing wireless power transfer system. So there are different design objectives. In the first category where the, 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 the system is determined by wireless power transfer system is WPT needs to be optimized. And that's actually a challenging system for uh, uh, wireless power transfer engineers to do your best work to get the maximum power transfer to uh, biomedical implants or uh, uh, to, to, be, to, to have a very efficient mobile factory automation that is based on WPT or something else. In the second category, uh, wireless power transfer system is, should be designed to support autonomy. But what is even more important and sometimes somehow neglected is that wireless power transfer system should expect and use the help of uh, uh, intelligence and autonomy installed on the device. So with the help of that autonomy, for example, we can solve a lot of wireless power transfer uh, uh, system issues. As for example, uh, alignment, uh, foreign object detection, cyber safety, communication, everything, for example, of that exists already in, 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 AUV and we can use it in our WPT system. So in other words, autonomous uh, uh, researchers and, and designers of autonomous system should work hand in hand with the uh, WPT researchers and engineers to build a system that works best for both worlds. And finally, uh, we need to talk about the third category, uh, convenience. Uh, we need to focus on improving convenience uh, we are some somehow serving that system and uh, we need to focus on efficient time utilization, for example. We need to focus on portability and we need to avoid any unpleasant situation that a uh, charging system can 
produce. For example, you have a charging platform, you put the two cell phones, and when you put the second cell phone, the, the system stops working. That's what we want to avoid, and our, our system needs to be designed in that direction to improve and maximize the convenience that uh, system provides. Uh, based on these three kind of directions, future, uh, uh, future applications, I kind of uh, uh, um, uh, identified some uh, critical uh, research, uh, research uh, uh, challenges and directions in the future, and intentionally I put standardization. Standardization is very important, and it took almost 10 years to develop first standards for uh, 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 electric vehicles, and the Qi standard and air fuel alliance standard also exist for low power devices. And that's a very important sec, uh, topic because that allows uh, industry members to uh, enter this area and participate actively in developing, selling, and improving wireless tra wire transfer system. Next uh, question is, of course, uh, getting more power from uh, uh, wireless charging systems uh, using modular or uh, even single, single unit designs. Then, as I already talked about, the integration between intelligence and automation. Uh, with the wireless power transfer system, which can solve a lot of problems that we are wireless power transfer uh, designers now trying to solve, which may not be necessary. And then, of course, grid integration. One problem that is typically neglected is uh, power metering. How are we going to measure the power we deliver, for example, to an electric vehicle? The only fair way to measure is to measure the power that goes through air gap. But that's very, very difficult. Uh, so we measure power on the primary, measure the secondary, and always somebody is... Uh, charge more in that case. Uh, we expect new uh, advance in uh, uh, material design, uh, including magnetic, uh, magnetic materials, wires, uh, testing procedure, as I mentioned, and test beds are very important. And we have some test beds for stationary charging systems. Uh, we expect more, of course, uh, test beds for dynamic charging system in the future. Uh, we, want, we, we need to work uh, closely with uh, uh, um, mechanical engineers. We need to work with uh, uh, civil engineers to De derive a, a close procedure, uh, uh, exact procedure, how to install these devices inside the road and to guarantee, for example, when you inside the dynamic charging, install the dynamic charging system in a highway, you need to guarantee 20 years of operation. And uh, uh, when you mention to uh, civil engineers to put something in the road, they are very skeptic and they are very worried how it's going to work in the long run. And of course, uh, everything is about the economy and financial side, and we need uh, more exact uh, evaluations of uh, capabilities and financial uh, closing financial construction for, for example, some uh, um, uh, large projects related to uh, dynamic uh, charge. Uh, this, these are, uh, uh, and uh, at the end, I would like to mention uh, some uh, uh, agencies and uh, uh, centers that supported our research, including Freedom. Uh, System Research Center, then Department of Energy Power America Program, Department of Health and Human Services, the Toyota Motor Corporation, Toyota Research Institute of North America, and Select Research Center at Utah State University. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are open for your questions. Uh, uh, myself and, and uh, uh, Dr. Togo Kohli will uh, try to answer. Uh, if we cannot answer some of these questions, feel free to contact us, uh, and we are open for any collaboration in the future. So feel free to contact us if you have some ideas how our work can be uh, advanced or how we can actually combine our research efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pantich and uh, Dr. Tavakoli. Appreciate um, the presentation. We do have a couple of questions uh, that were put in the chat. Um, and uh, this relates to, um, to raise your presentation. So in the dynamic wireless power transfer systems, uh, which type of compensation system is good and what type of receiver pad power conditioner will be the optimal choice? And you're muted, Reza. Reza, you're muted. <laughs> Excuse you me go. about that. So do we, I was saying that there is no solid answer to that, but uh, what we use with LCC compensation, and we think up to a medium power, of like 30 kilowatt, 50 kilowatt LCC and double LCC would be good, but going more than 50 kilowatt, probably uh, series, series compensation would be the compensation to go for. Uh, in terms of power conditioner at the receiver side, again, for the bus project, we use the buck converter, but it depends on your design. But 
Uh, people have used Buck, Buck Boost, and Boost, but what we used was Buck. And again, it depends on the system and the you know details of how the system is designed. Okay. Um, and uh, one final question. Looks like we're right at noon right here. Um, several people have asked if uh, we could share the slides, and I assume that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay. I see both of you nodding. Yes, yes. Uh, I think it's okay. Uh, yeah, we'll, we can share slides. Okay, good. So we, we will send the slides to the attendees. Um, and we, uh, we're, we're right at noon here. If, um, if anyone still has questions that were unanswered, um, you know, feel free to uh, email us. Our contact information is on the Freedom System website. And like we said, the recording of this uh, presentation will be available on the uh, North Carolina State Electrical and Computer Engineering um, YouTube channel, uh, which you can find just through a Google search. It'll show up uh, in a couple of days. Thanks a lot for attending, and I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you. Thank you.